scene. Hello, <laughs> and welcome to 52 List Podcast with Maria Seal. That's me. Today, I have Kate Van Petten, who is not only a friend of mine here in Seattle, but also an extremely talented artist in many facets. <clears throat> they are a musician, a poet. Uh, they just released a short film. They released an album of songs and poetry very recently, which you can find on Bandcamp, but you can also find them on Spotify. They're all over the place doing incredible things. They just released their cassette tape of music and poetry with Hello America Stereo Cassette, which is really fun. We're in, a, we're in the age of celebrating fun, quirky ways to listen to music and celebrate art. And I think releasing a cassette tape is such a cool way of expressing yourself. So welcome to the podcast, Kate. We need like an applause button, like... You know, I think somewhere on here, there. <laughs> oh, let's go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it yeah. was seamless. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for that beautiful intro. Sometimes you don't realize who you are until you hear someone else say it to you. Mm-hmm. It's really nice to have, you know, I think that's why humans need other humans. So we're not just trapped in our own little spiraling worlds. Absolutely. Reflection and, and refraction is so important. Very helpful. And I feel um, lucky to have friends like you who you're also a Gemini. And yes. there's so many other things and musician and artist. Yeah. And I want to get into <clears throat> all of the facets of who you are. You and I are both Geminis. We are both identify as non-binary. I use the word woman and she sometimes, but you're more solidly in the non-binary category. We're both queer. We're both tender-hearted people who need to express ourselves through the arts. <laughs> and I'm curious to hear about the many different beginnings of who you are. I feel like right now where you're at is uh, a new beginning in many ways. Uh, and yeah, let's explore those today. I think if my child self saw me now, they would be shocked. They just like would not even have the words to express um, that person that they saw. They wouldn't even know <laughs> the winding path that it took to get me here. Yeah. And, you know, I was recently unemployed. So there's also a lot of shifting and change happening in what my routines are and what my desires are and what, what I want to do with my life. So, um, and my Saturn return is coming up. I'm 28. So I'm, I'm approaching my Saturn return. Um, so yeah, change, change is in the air. It is, it's time. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Chicago in a, a small town outside of Chicago. Um, and I had no idea that queer people existed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, relatable. I didn't even know it was an option. If it was, it was like um, gay white men. Yeah. Which they were icons. I was like, I yeah. love them. <laughs> <laughs> that was so a multiple flavor for culture. Exactly. Yeah. Um, definitely didn't know what being non binary was or that that was an option. <laughs> didn't even know, you know, like these concepts of gender, like outside of um, the sex you're assigned at birth. That was not a concept that was taught in <laughs> um, a small town in Illinois where I grew up. Did you, when you were growing up, were you aware of any of these? No. Oh, okay. Mm, I got uh, <clears throat> the one relative I had on my mom's side was an old crotchety gay man. Uh, he died. I think maybe almost 10 years ago now, his name was Uncle Toby. Toby. Uh, but he lived in New York and uh, he was just such a bitch, but in the fun way. Um, so I grew up with my one gay icon in my family. My mom's literal name is gay. Uh, so that was always confusing. And uh, I didn't know any representation of... Uh, people who were born in bodies like mine uh, being gay. Or what I did here was men can be gay. Uh, women just have daddy, daddy issues. Yeah. Yeah. That was the narrative I heard. And it just turns into a lot of 
confusion, right? Because you're like, well, I I don't feel so rigidly in this gender the way that um, clothing and color and narratives that I'm seeing in films and books, like I'm not seeing how I think I want to be in that. But since I'm only, I'm, you know, I, I'm only in this box, so I guess I have to try. Mm-hmm. And that creates a lot, that's, that's trauma, right? Like trying to fit yourself into something you know that you don't want or that you won't fit into is traumatic. And then there's a lot of, there's so much unlearning. There's so like, you know, once you're, once you get the words that you need to describe these identities, um, so much unlearning and new vocabulary, developing a new way of speaking, of building community, of manifesting your desires, which for so long I had just suppressed. I was like, well, I thought of life as something that happened to me. This is, that's a direct quote from one of the pieces on my tape. Like I, for so long, life was something that was happening to me that I didn't have control over. So I just kind of rode with it. Um, so much so that even when I was, you know, picking colleges to go to or pick, you know, deciding what I would be doing with my future, I didn't even feel in control. Like I was so just dizzied by all of the choices that didn't, didn't feel like there were, there was a path that fit mine. I was so dizzied by it that like, all of that, that era of my life becomes such a blur. Mm -hmm. I even have like bad, I don't have such a good um, memory recalling that. And I, I moved around a little bit as a, as a kid too. So that also like fractures how, how how memory serves you, especially when it comes to identity. Um, And jobs did your parents have growing up? My dad, um, he was a web developer. So he taught himself how to code really young. He never went to college or anything like that. Um, but then he opened a cafe. He fell in love with coffee and a, a bakery too. And so I, I fell in love with coffee and he was a musician too, just on the mm-hmm. side. He was in a bunch of bands, released some records. So music and coffee really were his main yeah. two things. My mom was a nurse. She is the most careful, caring, loving, gentle person. And they really balance each other in that way. And I feel like I really have equal parts of both of them um, as a true Gemini, where I can see myself reflected in both like the gentle care of my mom with this nurse energy, right? And then my dad's more chaotic, artistic um, uh, sort of energy. And, you know, I've, I've, I'm a musician now myself. I've also worked in coffee. Um, I haven't been a nurse, but I'd like to think that I spend a lot of time caring for people, um, the people around me. So yeah, I see myself uh, reflected in them all the time. Did you ever feel like, I think when you're in a small town, uh, rural areas, or I don't know, just just growing up at any time other than literally right now, (laughs) where there is more representation of queer people, the world um the only words that i could attach to were like artsy indie creative musician all of these things were like uh yes i am left of center but these are the labels i know so i'll stick to those do you feel like you kind of clung to those labels early on or it sounds like you probably had validation of those labels maybe within your family definitely having a a musician father um propelled me into a world where music was a place I could put these feelings. Music was a place that I could go to, to make them make sense. Right. Um, I could, uh, see myself reflected in songs instead of people. So even when maybe their identities, I didn't see myself reflected in, in their music, I could, I could kind of separate identity from art. And then I was like, Oh, this is a place I can be anyone. Like I can be any character, feel anything, tell any story. So naturally I got into theater as many young queer people do (laughs) Um, and just fell in love with the idea of becoming someone completely different, especially when those stories um, were outside of gender. Right. So anything like cartoons, I fell in love with, you know, cartoons or, you know, be it Disney movies or anything that could kind of like take gender out of the equation or have it really be about like the core of what, what that story is. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the- theater was a huge part of my life. I did study it in my undergrad and I started writing plays and um, practicing with uh, performance art. So the idea of like, what what is theater when we, we take it like off of the stage? What is it when we start manipulating different variables that traditionally theater hasn't? So got involved in the storefront scene in Chicago. I spent a year in um, London at Queen Mary University of London studying performance art and yeah. 
um, creating and, and uh, did my thesis there. And it was a ton of fun and just fell in love with the idea that you can be anyone, like you can feel anything. And the same things with the song, you can feel anything for five minutes. Mm-hmm. You can tap into any story, any energy. You um, can transform, you can enter into a different world with just a somatic like switch being yeah. turned on. It seems like, I would kind of argue that queer people from a young age, we, before we could even consider who we are, we were told to perform. Uh, So we are highly practiced in performing. Same with for me being autistic. I, from a young age, needed to figure out how do I socialize? Uh, The same thing for queer community. Uh, The same for really any marginalized group. Uh, We are all told, act like a straight white man or submit to the straight white man and perform. So it seems really natural that of course you're gonna gravitate towards like, okay, well, I I can't, uh, I'm not even given space to figure out who I am. So let's let's perform, let's play, let's find release in other realms and share my feelings in ways that feel safe and there's a place for it. Which becomes dangerous sometimes too, because you forget who you are and all of that. Because yeah. if you could be anything and if ev- you're performing in any moment then, then who really are you? So it took yeah. years to build back, like, what are my desires? How do I return to center? Where is that center? Where is the self? And it took so much self-work and community building and bravery, um, which, uh, Maria more today. <laughs> my book 52 is for bravery. Bow, bow, bow. Nice segue. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's such a beautiful, I'm, I'm so honored to be, uh, to be talking to you about this because it is your most recent 52 lists. Correct. And it is the most, um, open-ended in the way that like queer, non-binary, any, like people can really see the, the millions of fractured realities of who they can be and talk about escape through art, through reading these lists, you can, it asks you directly to, to center yourself. And what do you want? Who are you? What does your future look like? Take control of that, which so many people um, aren't given a space where they can do that. We're certainly not when we're growing up and even in adulthood, like life is so busy and there's bills and (laughs) cars and, um, so many responsibilities, but having a place to, to center yourself and ask yourself questions is so special. So like the idea that you have, you know, shared with this with thousands and thousands of people who now maybe are braver, stronger, um, a more centered version of their self is, I just got chills talking about Aww, it. Like, do you ever just you. sit and think about that? Like you have changed so many people's lives. I hope so. You know, it's a weird, it's a weird... <laughs> very strange thing to create these things. Uh, I don't know. The way that I function has always been like highly observing people so that I can figure out who I am to not uh, in opposition, not uh, in trying to absorb other people in, but just trying to study people. Why do we function the way that we do? Why are we all so sad? Why are we all so uncomfortable within ourselves? Why are we all people pleasing? I've always just been asking questions. So it just felt natural to create these things that I hope will help people figure out. Yeah, maybe help them answer their own questions. Um, But I can, it's very easy to kind of disassociate from uh, knowing that people are actually using my work and it it surprises me every time someone messages me and says something really heartfelt like it really helped their relationship in the 52 list for togetherness or they realize they really don't know themselves and 50, the first 52 list project was a great entry or bravery truly did give them the words to figure out how to advocate for themselves all of those <clears throat> responses are uh, mind-blowing um but again growing up uh, gendered as a girl, I have also, I still have to remember, like, you're allowed to accept praise or compliment or <laughs> receive affirmation that you've done something right. Because my conditioning is to be able to, like, humbly push things away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's wild learning, observing people learning about themselves through things I've created. 
And books are usually answers, but your books are questions, which I think it's so beautiful that you inherently as a person invite people into your world instead of writing what you know, which you could do that too. You could write your own experiences and your answers to those questions, but instead and it's so Gemini like too to do this. <laughs> you ask and you create open spaces for people. And something my friends and I, and I, that I say in my work and with my friends a lot is people are just waiting to be asked. You don't even know that you need someone to ask you, but the moment they ask you, you're like, oh my, oh my gosh, this question means everything to me, which is why community is so important because you need your people to be like, but what do you really want? Or, yeah. you know, what do you have that you didn't have before? right? You asked me that question for this. Um, what, that was the question, right? Is what, what dreams do you have that, or what were your dreams that you have now? Something like that. Yeah. And the things that you dreamt of having in your life that you do have now. Yeah. And I didn't even realize that was a question. When I first heard it, I was like, well, man, it's so it's, it's easy to talk about the things you have. Like, I want to think about the things I want, right? We're so focused on what we want, especially as Mm -hmm. Americans as, Mm -hmm. you know, we're focused on what we want and how to get there, but we don't take as much time for reflection of what do, what do we have? Where, where have you come from? And at first I was like, well, it's such a positive thing. Like, here's my list of accomplishments. No, it can be bad too. One of the things I put on the list was trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Trauma. (laughs) We have trauma. Like, I guess technically the question was about dreams though, like something you dreamt of having. I didn't dream of having trauma. (laughs) But you did uh, dream of knowing yourself and to get there, sometimes it requires going through traumatic experiences. Yes. And then learning that you do have the right to stand up for yourself and search for yourself, even when it is so painful. Yep. And in that way we did, yeah, we dreamt of trauma to get through it, to have the skills to deal with everything life would throw at us Um, because it's not all going to be good. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's another thing so much of my work focuses on is like this in between, like Mm -hmm. for growing up, I thought there were two options for so many things, not just gender and sexuality, but, um, that there's like these two paths, but it was so liberating for me to realize. Um, and there's this, there's this plaque at this resort called Dobe, which I was at this past weekend. It's an incredible place, soaking tubs, just really good energy. Um, there's this plaque, there's three tubs and it says, um, between the opposites lies the path. And I first saw that like uh, around the time I, I first moved to Seattle or a few years after that. And I remember like, huh, this is about more than just the tubs. Cause I think the tubs, it's like temperature. So they're the coolest to, to the hottest. But I was like, there's like, I'm drawn to this phrase in like a celestial <laughs> kind of way. And it started just being a mantra for me. It's so important to have those mantras because you can start, okay, like where are all the places in my life where this is relevant and why? And it helps you dig to the center of that, um, which is what we're all doing. We're just trying to get to the fine center and, and hold it there because so much of the world is moving around us and we can't control that. But you, it sounds like you went to take a bath and you actually dipped into the waters of Buddhism because <laughs> uh, like Buddhism is all about finding the middle way. And I don't know, everything you were just saying made me also think about how uh, in in olden times, in ancient times, we were raised within community. And if we were raised within community, it meant that we saw lots and lots of options of different types of people. It probably was easier to figure out who you are because you weren't just given two options. When you have just two parents, when you say that your whole value is rooted in the two people who... Uh, you have genetic ties to or were adopted by that kind of only gives you two examples and of course you're going to be kind of stuck in this binary of I'm either am I either practical nurse caring mom or am I artistic creative entrepreneurial dad these are my I can only be it's either or or I'm just allowed two versions of self that are in opposition of each other Mm. and that's so silly (laughs) we just again uh maybe if you had grown up in immersed in a wider community you might have from an earlier age been like yeah i am queer i am creative i am uh entrepreneurial i am driven i am soft i am tough i am all these different things uh 
But I think, I don't know, the way when I listen to your music, what I hear is you exploring in so many ways, giving some answers, but every answer still leads to a question. Um, and I think that is a really powerful thing that is inherent in you, in all of the art that you create, and is a like defining factor of what makes great art is, uh, yes, you are giving your perspective and your experience translating a story through your work, but you're also inviting people in to hear, to attach to different things that you might not have meant to create. All of that is so magical. And to me, that makes sense too, why everybody, everybody listens to music, everyone. And we're all probably drawn to it so that we can find some different voices when we're stuck in a place where we only have one or two voices telling us who we can or cannot be. Hmm. When did you start creating music? Oh gosh. Um, so, so early. I mean, there was a piano in my house growing up um, cause my dad played and we, we were playing and at the first moment of having motor skills that would allow you to play. Um, so yeah, really I've, I've been, at least writing music since, since I was able to, and then songs. Um, def- I think I started writing maybe in middle school or even grades. It's possible that it was in grade school. I don't remember the first song. People often ask that. I, I, I don't remember, but I loved musical theater because I loved write that vessel of storytelling, um, which so much of like popular music right now is confessional, um, that there was like a divide there for me, which, you know, it was also so liberating to be like, wait, music doesn't have to be confessional. It can be this open ended, this question, this story, um, which is the goal of a lot of the music and the poetry that I make. But yeah, I started writing musicals. I would write musicals with my dad and I produced two musicals in high school with some friends that ended up making like a few thousand dollars for a cancer resource center. So yeah, it was also this vessel for good too. I was like, I can have this fun, bring all these people together, tell this story and make money doing it. Like I want to do that forever, like, and, and give back to my community from it. Um, so I, we wrote a Mario musical, like Mario <laughs> brothers, a hunger games. Like we would take these books or these stories and, you know, Mario, of course, there's a lot of heteronormativity and, and gender and whatever in that, but they are these like characters that kind of exist in this like dreamlike world mm-hmm. that you can tap into seeing yourself in them. So I found that really beautiful. Um, but yeah, my, my first songs were probably musical theater adjacent songs. Um, I would learn how to play, uh, I would have all the sheet music for whatever like Broadway show was coming through town. Like that would be the merch that I bought was the sheet music. So I could go home and try to learn how to play it. Um, I was obsessed with Joni Mitchell, um, from a super young age. My dad, yeah. Um, my dad exposed me to her, um, music super, super young, which completely changed my life. Um, seeing somebody who can feel so big and tell so many stories. Um, the album blue, like even as a kid, I was like, that's it. (laughs) Mm. Um, so she meant a lot to me. And then Regina Spector, I, um, loved her music. I saw that was one of like my first concerts. That's like that, like I chose like that. I was like, can we please go to this? And her ability to tell a story from any perspective is, um, (laughs) so, so impactful, um, changed my life too. Um, but yeah, it also isn't lost on me what we were talking about before that I'm from the middle of the the country, the United States, and I moved left, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, which so many people do. Um, and, and I followed a band to like, I had met some people in Illinois. I also went to school in Illinois, um, and followed a band there and followed this dream of like this artistic community in in Seattle, this musically driven coffee city. It has like all of these things, right. That I already love so much. And how old were you? And were you aware of your own queerness at that point? Had you come out any of that? Um, it was right after college. Um, I was fully aware. (laughs) 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 I was very aware. Um, but I was not, fully out, but had like, I would definitely, I, there was never a moment where I like came out where I was like, here I am. This is what I, what I am. It was more a slow, again, centering of oneself and like a mention here or there of like, well, I could, 
or like, maybe I am like those, those types of like flirting with the truth um, before, instead of just stating it. Cause again, it didn't feel like something I needed to say that was so rigid. Um, Cause love never felt rooted in gender to me too. So like, you know, that might've been different if I was like, okay, well, I just like girls, but that's not it. Like I like people and I want to completely explode this idea of what gender and sexuality is and liberate it beyond anything that <laughs> I was taught when I was growing up in order to exist in a more, um, a, a more centered version of, of the self and with the people around me. And so, um, no, but I, I mean, I wasn't, you know, out, I wasn't, I also wasn't non-binary. I was still using she, her pronouns for a while. Um, and I, I was aware in, in high school, I think was when I first, um, learned what, like what it would mean to choose different pronouns or what, what that identity looked like, but like not in any deep way. Um, <laughs> just in a way where like, I would see it and be like, no. <laughs> there's another option, but yeah, being in Seattle, um, uh, just completely transformed my view of what people and community and identity could possibly look like and open up to the, opened up the door to multitudes of yeah. possibility. Yeah. I guess in that, that's now is a time that I would love to hear what is on your list. So list number seven from 52 list for bravery. That is like, I feel like that sounds like such a pivotal transformation point going from one self to another, keeping parts of the old self, fulfilling dreams you know, didn't know you had, also letting go of things that you thought maybe were a dream and were not right for you. Mm. I'm so curious to hear what's on your list of the things you once dreamt of having in your life that you do have now and maybe also some knots. Yeah. I have a surprise for you. Yes. <laughs> So I was sitting down to write this, um, at a cafe and with the book and, um, I love lists too. Maybe it's a Gemini thing where we're like, well, it can't be, <laughs> can't be full blown like writing. And it also isn't doing, but it's like the in-between of what doing and writing, right? Lists. Um, I'm so verbose. <laughs> I like a list to be like, okay, pull it in, just pull yep. it in. <laughs> yep. And, um, one of my teachers had pointed out to me that in my poetry, a lot of them end up being lists. Like mm -hmm. my writing is the best when it's repetitive, when there's some, like when I'm making a list of something. So I was like, what if instead of writing a traditional list, I wrote a poem, that's a list. So I'm going to read it to you if you, if that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I titled it dreams I have now, which felt like a simplification of the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So dreams I have now in the morning, I have desire for raw yellow ritual. I will ride and keep riding until I see clarity in what was once blurry, a marker in the empty sky, skin and the stained covers, a tether to the spirit from toes to eye number three. That is the opposite between paths. Now I have more words that describe specificity of these paths of the self that is others and the others in the self loving people loving people i have wounds that have scabbed over time or two which makes a third transformation between born and bled i have balms for these triggers i know now i have welcomed sorrow it comes in the front door with a spare key made in fire by ruptured feelings in practice of joy making. I have decided what gets in. The light does what it does. And we, we were always angels unlearning, learning an encyclopedia of mushrooms and sea life. And I have seen life, how you can choose to be something else. I have chosen to be something else. I have a static presence, alone, a peace with my woman, a bone with my man a power in my body, a specificity to the problems, and an edge to explain them well in hard conversation. I have access to me, to this progress of resurrection, this cycle of transformation, this tenderness, a decade's worth of hair. I could have cut off and did not because that would be for you. Doing things for you is brave. Never mind who you is, just doing things is brave. But deciding not to, 
deciding to break the cycle, to make quilts of healed patterns, deciding not to cut, but to grow, is brave. Very, very brave. A well of beautiful mistakes forms and I pull out my dreams as ancient coins my ghosts knew. I now have a destination, a deck of cards as my Bible, an understanding of stars, high expectations, low certainty swaying, a beautiful, ugly, limitless, romantic mythology of what else might be possible, a delight for strangers, a foundation of self to return to, a misunderstood wilderness of adversaries, a pocket full of spare keys, a vacation on the books, and someone to watch the house, an artifact of my story and people who hear it and think, that's me, a person who makes love to me and think, that's me, in their pleasure, a language for this feeling, a currency to support it, a schedule that allows it, a quick nap, a little snack, a sweet ride, hair peeking out, a helmet in the wind, riding into now, dreams I have, now. <laughs> oh, it's so lovely. If you are listening or watching, I would say you must have heard something in there that sounds like you. That sounds like your experience and that just, yeah, that is so beautiful. That so fully encompasses ah, that feeling of bravery, bravery, that feeling of just allowing yourself to exist truthfully and honestly and allowing whatever comes from that to be. That really sounds, oh, that's so lovely and now really encourages me to be like, okay, now I need to make uh, 52 poems for bravery or 50 yeah, <laughs> or encourage people to, uh, instead of making a list this week, try turning it into a poem because that's such where a list can be so kind of cerebral and detached from the self in a lot of ways. Poetry is such a beautiful way of you know, feeling every single thing that you are processing and putting onto the page. That was a so list beautiful. is a poem. A list is a poem. I think also yeah. liberating ourselves from the idea that like when you sit down and write a poem, it has to be this thing, this like, you know, romantic, beautiful language. But like when you make a list, you're writing a poem. If you believe that mm -hmm. um, I've read your lists. They are already poems. Nothing needs to happen to them to make them um, that way. And so much gets in in a list, right? Because you're, you know, you can, like, what if you read that without knowing what the question was? I think you'd still know, yeah. um, which is so cool. Like you yeah. could read someone's grocery list and know what that was. But yeah, I um, I read this to Gray and I was like, I can't just get on a podcast and read this and not have like shared it with anyone <laughs> before. So I read it to Gray in the car. Um, um, when I was driving them to work and they mentioned the a deck of cards as a Bible, cause you have a tarot deck mm. coming out. And that line was about tarot, but <clears throat> initially it was like, it had called out tarot, but I like to fracture the words to make them more welcoming. So some people like they don't dig tarot. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of queer people do, but you know, some people don't and that's totally okay. So changing the phrase to a deck of cards as my Bible, um, invites in people like, what is that deck of cards? It could just be about a game. It could be that like the game of life is, is my Bible now, or that, you know, the, um, uh, whatever else a deck of cards could mean to you, like fracturing words in order to let people in, which is how we have, how real change happens is meeting people where they're at and having conversations that aren't, you know, I also mentioned about, um, uh, a specificity, an edge to explain problems well in hard, in hard conversations. That's something I have that I didn't have before. Mm. Um, and a lot of people who are coming into identities or marginalized people in general, um, when you don't have the words to talk to people who have hurt you or people who look like you, um, you can get mean, you can get, it's, it's fear driven. Um, you can lose friends that way. You can lose family. Um, and sometimes that's okay. There are, you know, there, there are levels to it. There's nuance here. Um, but having, having the ability to fracture your words in a way that welcomes more people in is a skill that I have developed slowly and carefully that I value 
<laughs> more than than anything else. So I also pulled some themes from this list just in case that was like too, just so there was like access to to this. So I'm just going to read all of them. Yeah. And then you, if there's one that jumps out, you can do it. Um, love, identity, possibility, community, trauma, words, creativity, time, experiences, education, and intent. Mm -hmm. So especially when you're, yeah, intent is like when, when I was growing up, all I wanted more than anything, more than love or a, a lover or a crush or a anything, I wanted autonomy. I mm -hmm. wanted to just have a choice. Mm. And intent, you can only have intent when you have choice. Like, it doesn't matter <laughs> what intent you have if you have no choice or no opportunity to take action. Yep. Um, and I can see that I nannied for many years from 12 to 24 at one point for like 12 hour days, uh, five days a week. And it was also, I'm sure that nannying and caring for kids so much has gone into writing my books because at the core of all of us is still a kid yelling out for attention or for validation or mm -hmm. let me have a voice. Um, so yeah, I think intent is such a, a special word to consider as a grown up when reflecting on a younger self. Yes. Uh, at the beginning of this year, um, at the turn of the new year, I, I always buy a new journal and pick a word. That's going to be the word for that year. And I don't know why it's just, it's like something that's kind of like plucked from my like psyche. Um, but this year I bought that new journal and the word was intent. So it's funny that you focus. I added it to this list, like at the end, cause I was like, oh yeah, like this, this is the newest one intent. Cause there's some of that in identity possibility, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's intent in all of that. But now that I've I've, I've come this far. I'm settled with a partner. I love, I have a community that I, it deeply fulfills me. I feel really settled. Um, now it's about focusing on that intent. What do you want to do with it? Mm -hmm. And that was before I was laid off from my job. It was right. <laughs> so I knew, I mean, I knew that something was, was brewing. Um, but what a, what a special word to now be carrying with me, um, is intent as I look for a new job or as I, um, uh, use my time to do different things. Time is such a gift and it being given back to me, um, at this time has been so special and healing and transformative. And when you give yourself time, um, to look and think deeply about who you are, which is what these books do, what all of the 52 list books do. They give you your, it's the gift of time, um, with yourself to think about, you know, who you are, even outside of therapy, because therapy is a great tool for that too, but you're still building and, you know, working with another person, right. To, to rebuild that. And they have their own plan that you are a part of, but, um, you also need to spend time just you centered in what are my desires? Where do I, where did I come from? Where do I want to go? Um, so yeah, in, intent felt like such an important word to describe that. Yeah. I think, uh, it, you're a really interesting person as a Gemini, uh, because I can see the ways that you really flow and jump into whatever is happening in the present, you're in it. And also I can see how uh, you must be very aware of that self. So you create a lot of structure to give meaning to that free flowing self. Like I mm. love hearing how uh, you and your partner Gray, you know, last summer was your summer of learning how to do, uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the word now, cookouts. How to crab, crab, yeah. how to crab. And so yeah. this summer it's no, now we want to do now our summer thing is deep sea swimming or deep free diving. Yeah. Diving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're really good at creating framework around whatever thing you want to flow within. Titling. Titling is so important to me as a poet and a songwriter. It's like, what is that name that you attach to things? The naming of things is so important as a queer non-binary person. Like yeah. it's so critical to have a name for these things. You're right. Like the summer of this, the year of this, like I attached to these 
themes because I, as an, I'm an air sign and I'm like a Gemini, Libra, Libra. So like mm-hmm. air, yeah. I'm just up here <laughs> all the time. So I need little anchors, right? <laughs> Deep in my ocean to, to, um, weigh me down. Um, and those anchors for me are words. They always have, and, and, and titles given yeah. to what I'm doing, but yeah, a lot of air and I love air signs. I'm surrounded <laughs> by them. I just, I get, I, I pluck them from any friend group, any community. <laughs> Look at this yeah. cloud passing through my cloud. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm very similar. And I find uh, you're very inspiring for me in this way because growing up, um, I was very, people constantly called me rigid, uptight, cerebral. Uh, people would tell me like, you think so much. Like as a criticism, um, I was... I was just analyzing people all the time. I did not know how to socialize with people very well because I was just observing people kind of from the outside, like fly on the wall being like, why do teenagers act like this? Why are we so (laughs) rude? Why do we like, I was the regulator of things. Um, So now as a grown up who has gone through my wild periods later than everybody else, I finally figured out how to human and be free and have fun. Like in my late twenties, um, early thirties, I now have this kind of fear of creating containers for myself because I still mm-hmm. have this self consciousness of, will people think I'm too rigid? Mm. Will people think this or that? Uh, and that is still, that's still a little internal battle that I have. So it's very encouraging and inspiring for me to observe people like you who are, have just exponential creativity, uh, that also, uh, yeah, you figure out what are the right containers for you so that your creativity can flow and you oh. name them and there is not shame there. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful jeweled box. And I'm inspired by you. Gray and I were talking in the car on the way, uh, again, this, the same conversation we were talking about you and we were talking about how you're such a creative person energy in every direction, like so many mediums, you've lived so many lives, you've been so many people, but you constantly come back to start. You have this, this structure, um, that you come back to lists, um, being the first one that I noticed, but Gray had mentioned the way that you were painting. They were like, I was watching Moo paint and like, yes, it's so creative and expressive and whatever, but like the, the, the process in which they created to start doing it was so methodical yet somehow still creative, which feels so Gemini to me that you have the ability to create those structures that don't inhibit creativity. That's that magic balance. Right. And I may be a little too much on the creative side. I need a little more, I like, I can learn from you from how you've created those containers and like place a few more in my life. These books are a good way to do that. Like <laughs> by having the, like I can begin that, like creating space to think about my bravery or what, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I, now I witness you and see how you create that structure and I'm inspired by it. So it's so interesting as we grow and change how much we can learn from each, when we see ourselves reflected in people, what we can learn, because mm-hmm. I hope in 10 years, I have the problem you're having and recorrect the <laughs> other way. Yeah. And that's really <laughs> what life is. It's like you learn something and then you realize you went really hard. So now yep. you need to unlearn a little bit and then you learn a new thing. And then you realize how far you went. So you need to unlearn again. Uh, yep. I think we're both very much in that phase. Uh, I mean, I think, and I think unfortunately and fortunately, a lot of people are experiencing that with the mega amount of layoffs that are happening yep. across the U.S. right now, especially in the tech world, but also in uh, even smaller businesses too with uh, <laughs> just the way everything is going. Yeah. Uh, what was kind of your first... I don't know. Do you feel like in the first few days after being laid off, do you feel like there was kind of a sudden awareness of like, oh, I was really immersed in that or, oh, did I just let my whole identity or my whole value be placed in that? Yep. We give ourselves to our work, especially people who work in industries that they're also personally close to, whatever that might mean. We give, I mean, Mo, you done that. Your name is on your business. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, you're not going to get laid off because you're the boss, but, um, we, we put our whole, especially Americans in, in our culture, we put our whole identities into 
um, what we're producing. Um, and oftentimes for people, that's, that's their work and like, they don't have time for anything else. Yeah. And I do feel lucky that I have practices to return to like music, like poetry, um, all of these art forms to return to, to be like, who am I? Where is center outside of this value I was creating, um, for a job. So yeah, I had to unlearn some of, especially productivity. I had to unlearn. I still haven't slept in. I've been waking up every day and like sitting, even I'll just intuitively go sit at my computer because I'm so used to doing that. Um, and in some ways it's been good because it's given me a ton of opportunities and I've been able to fill this gift of time with meeting so many wonderful people and, and, and writing. I'm, I'm writing for a barista magazine and it just meeting all of these incredible people and listening to their stories has been so beautiful. But there was that moment of like, who am I when I'm not working? Who am I when my value isn't what I'm giving to the company I work for, the organization I work for? And I just want to say that anyone who's listening who has been laid off recently, I highly suggest 52 lists for bravery. I wish I had had it the day I was laid off mm -hmm. because it, to look for a job, to propel yourself from getting laid off, you're like, why did this happen? Why me? You'll never have those answers, right? Layoffs, it, it, it happens. It's, it's going to keep happening, but, um, it takes a lot of bravery to return to the job market or to return to yourself and ask who do I want to be and, and what am I going to do? And hopefully you have unemployment benefits that allow you to spend a little more time than usual thinking about what your desires are and how to be brave within asking for those desires. Writing a cover letter is an act of bravery, oh. bragging about yourself, um, to strangers on in a letter. I mean, that takes immense bravery. And, and this book, there were so many other questions in it besides the one we did that uh, would allow you to be like, okay, how do I center this bravery? What does it feel like? And how do I ask for a, what, you, you know, you separated it into those four chapters too. So you can see the phases of how we use bravery we versus how bravery. Yeah. Yep. It's okay. If you don't just tomorrow decide I'm brave now. No, it's a journey. And that is definitely yep. how the the journalist set up to ease you into it. Yes. Give you also permission to explore space where like, if you're a marginalized person, it's okay to be sad or upset about the ways that, that you are not existing within a system that is built to support you. So of course your bravery is going to look different than someone who uh, this system is built up for. So yeah, I want, I want the book to be a space of, you know, giving yourself permission. Yes, you may still like have that oomph to go sit at your desk and work on your computer, but hopefully uh, you feel yourself giving yourself permission to explore things on that computer that you normally wouldn't have. Uh, because yes, you are in a routine that feels like is supporting you, but there's space to explore in this interim period, remembering also that this is an interim period. Mm hmm that is, that I mean, in closing my storefront, mm. it, I closed it in 2020. It's 2023. And I still feel like I am like recovering from that because I really went from college to must build value, must build value to society. Society must uh, affirm me in, in my value, try, try to keep pleasing everybody. Um, to a point that I then disassociated from even seeing my name on a building and I just be like, ugh, ugh, ugh. <sighs> I don't, it freaks me out. Uh, I now have kind of the challenge of, uh, yeah, I need to get back into the working world. I have the privilege. I've had the privilege of taking my time. Um, but I still feel this kind of rebellion against the system. That mm. I don't want to, I want to be a part of this, but I live here in this country that is built upon this system. So I must figure out how to make it work for me. And we have to be part of it to change it. Yeah. Right? We can't just remove ourselves because um, then we can't change it for future generations of people who need our work, especially mm -hmm. your work. And there's so much loss embedded in in bravery because it means bravery means you're mo you're moving somewhere, right? You've taken a risk or, you know, you're moving into that new place and there's an, an inherent loss with that. Um, mm -hmm. And you can keep a lot, but with your storefront, I mean, I'm sure there was so much grief with losing that space um, that you didn't even maybe have time to process. Mm -hmm. And getting laid off is so similar where it's like, 
one day you're there and the next day you're gone and you don't have that in between a goodbye party a mm -hmm. you know that time to let go and and so much of like a capitalistic world doesn't make space for those like deeply human emotional yeah. in betweens um that There's we know that we need loss of community mm. is profound so profound so profound like for me there was uh as the company got bigger, I felt like more and more I needed to kind of pull away from my staff because I felt like it was inappropriate for me to be best buds with someone that mm. I had some sort of privilege or power over. Mm. Um, so there was grief that happened in the expansion of my business and seeing that like I need to play a different role that's not as like well, I just want to be friends with everybody, but that's not that's not your job. Mm. But even still in losing just getting to like talk with uh our sales associates every day that was such a joy mm. they're so awesome they're so sweet they're so fun they're so talented um doesn't matter even the boundaries that i still held it was still a, a loss yeah and i'm sure and the same for you with you know yeah. you, it wasn't it's it's such a beautiful thing to work, to have the privilege of working in a space that uh, does speak to a passion of yours with coffee, mm -hmm. with people, um, and still it cannot be right, not be totally right. There's still going to be microaggressions and being a queer person in that space. There's still going to be some ick, but still it was really nice having community. Yeah. And you don't want to draw those types of bond boundaries, right? Like, like you said, you wanted to be friends with, with, they're your community. If you're with them every day, like they're your people, but like these, these, this capitalistic, um, um, you know, forces us to create these boundaries, but I want to freely love the people I work with. I don't want to just see them as coworkers and you know, that there are some boundaries that need to be upheld there. Um, but like, shouldn't we love the people we spend our lives with? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't we? We should. Um, and I think that's what makes also the mass layoffs happening across the US, across the world right now, extra brutal because we were just in a pandemic where we couldn't be in community. In yeah. the last year, I feel like, like that's when we got to know each other in the past year because it was like we finally felt safe to like have some community events. And now uh, these community spaces of work are kind of kicking people out of community again. So we're all kind of reeling in, mm. in what does community mean for us? Where can I find stable community? Uh, and I think that also kind of plays into the list you filled out because, you know, as a kid, you know, if you could talk to your age, like 10 year old self, where would that little person think? they would be at the age you're at now what would their wow. lives look like what did they think it was going to be like would you still be in in illinois um wow i love that question it's so beautiful to think of what your childish desires were right before mm -hmm. you like especially the age of 10 like you're just on the cusp of understanding yeah. like realizing you could live anywhere you could do anything like what do you want to be when you grow up that question what do you want to be when you grow up um I, I always wanted to be a musician and be a writer and uh, especially make theater and tell stories. So I, like, that was my true no North. I knew I wanted to be a storyteller and I knew I wanted to be part of that. So, um, I don't think, um, what I'm doing would actually be a surprise at all. I think mm -hmm. some of the things about maybe my identity or how it manifested or, you know, um, I did dream of Seattle as a kid or mm. more specifically Olympia. I had read, um, Kurt Cobain's diaries. Have you ever read that? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a child, you should not read the, I read them in like middle school. That's not, nobody do that. Yeah. Um, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to move to Olympia and I'm going to be a riot girl. I'm going to be like, yeah. I'm going to be in this band and I'm going to be so rebellious. So that was like a distant dream that I had. So in that way, well, but even that is gendered, right? Like, well, I can't be Kurt Cobain, even though I want to be, so I'm going to be a riot girl. Cause that's like the closest adjacent identity that yeah. was within what I could do, which now looking back on that, I'm thinking about the, um, boy genius Rolling Stone cover. Have you seen it? 
haven't seen it, but we're fortunate. Like if childhood me could see that and see that like I could become those things that I love that like Kurt Cobain wasn't a far off dream, like be inspired. Don't be limited by your identity. But I was at the time. Um, I was. And if I could go back in time, I would also tell that little kid, like you can be anything. Like there are no rules. Like once you leave this place, like there will be no rules. And I definitely dreamed of like, I, it was always a dream to leave Illinois. I was never like St. Charles, Illinois. I'm going <laughs> to stay here forever. And you know, my family is still there. My um, brother settled there and, and owns a house there. My sister did move away, but you know, there was a world in which I settled down there and got married presumably to a man. And like, you know, all the, it's, it's so wild to think about all these people I could have been and still honor them. Right. Like I'm sure I would have, felt all the same things and they would have manifested in, in different but similar ways. Um, so it, it's a beautiful thing to think about. And have you seen the film Everything Everywhere all at once? Yeah. Oh my gosh. That like, that puts so like so much about the queer identity or just um, this idea of you being anyone, anywhere and all the people you could have been manifesting in a film was mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Yeah. Yeah. Did I ever tell uh, you that I really wanted to go to Wheaton outside of Chicago, which is a very, mm. very religious. You wouldn't be allowed to be who you are if oh, you had gone there. Oh, not at all. <laughs> I also fantasized about there was a record label that I loved in Omaha. And so I had these fantasies of Omaha, Nebraska yeah. as like yeah. this amazing place to be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very sweet to look back at your younger self and be like, oh, okay, well. Well, you were close. <laughs> no, <laughs> please, no, no. <laughs> it sounds Omaha is cool though. Was it Connor Oberst's label? Um, I did love Connor Oberst so so much. I loved Rilo Kylie, mm. um, and I think it yeah it must have been that label. Yeah, there was oh, also cool. another like mix CD that I had from a label in Omaha too that had other had some punk bands. It had a bunch of different people, but I was like, Omaha is where it's at. I gotta get there. Um, I still think that maybe there's a fractured reality somewhere where we met in Omaha. Yeah, for sure. We started a band. Like we started a band together. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's absolutely a possibility, and I think that's what's so cute too to think about your little ten year old self is that like that not far off. Yep. You, you stayed true to you. Mm -hmm. I, I needed to do a lot of unlearning. There was the, the art, the artistic self was always there. And it sounds like both of our, both of our artistic selves fought through the other influences of who we were supposed to be, who we, people told us we were supposed to be to mm -hmm. get to the blooming state that we are at now of, uh, we are in the right we're in the right soil to finally mm. grow. Yep. Um, we found our way. It just mm. took a long time to get there and a couple of states and some road trips and some mistakes and some trauma, but mm. here mm. you are. And tr there's the concept of like the transplant, right? The immigrant, the tra transplant. And there is something to be said about a generation of queer people who moved to Seattle specifically, um, seeking something better. Yeah. Um, and there is so much queer community here. I don't know like the stats on it, but it has to be one among the most queer friendly yeah. cities in America. And I meet so many people who are not from here um, that are all seeking that same, that same dream, mm -hmm. um, which is a beautiful thing to meet so many people from other places who came here um, yeah. to it's dream. A it's a huge privilege to live in a city and to be, to exist in certain neighborhoods where I feel normal. <laughs> I feel yeah. like in my weirdness and all of my oddities, I feel normal Yeah, in this place. Or at least welcome. Welcome. I feel mm. like I'm not going to be, I'm not living on edge walking around a neighborhood. Whereas yeah. in the, the town I grew up in, um, it's wild to remove, to grow up in a certain place to constantly feel this constant fear, 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 fear. Someone's going to find me out. Someone's going to attack me. Someone's going to do sexually assault me because of who I am 
to move to a place to finally get to a place where I'm like, oh, we're all weird. Oh, I feel so safe. To then go back to my original hometown and suddenly be back in that environment again. I'm like, oh my God, I want, I know that so many people in the world are stuck in places where they feel that constant state of, I don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I'm not sure why, but I don't feel safe. I really wish the opportunity for everybody to finally exist in a place where they just feel seen in a way that's not threatening. Yeah. Seen in a way that is celebrated. Mm. And Seattle does feel like, well, most neighborhoods, not all, but many neighborhoods make me feel seen in a way that is accepted. We're still working on the dream. There's still a lot of work to be done. And you and I hold a lot of privilege as as white people. Um, So there's so much more work to be done. And we need to use our privilege to dig even deeper into that, right? So that more and more people feel safe. I mean, trans people, indigenous people, um, speaking of the land that we're on. I mean, there's just work to be done in every direction. And the one that affects you most is maybe what you center or what you you focus on. But once you see all those fractured identities, you could have been anyone within them, which creates empathy and bravery. Um, the bravery to stand up for it because you're like, I know how that feels. I know what it feels like to be an outsider. I know what it feels like to be hurt. Um, and I want to create a world where that doesn't happen. Agreed. And I can see you doing that through the art that you create. I can see you creating space for people to find their voice within your voice. I can even, even, you know, taking it back to when you were talking about um, kind of unlearning, uh, responding with anger. Mm. Um, My therapist once told me most people's family train you to either respond to something that scares you with anger or respond with sadness. Mm. Um, and I was in a family of sad. My response mm. is to feel sad, to close up and to just hide away. Mm. Um, and I didn't understand people who responded with anger. <laughs> um, but both require to unlearn both of these things. It requires empathy. It requires listening. Yeah. It requires learning your own voice, standing up for yourself, but also recognizing as you start to empower yourself, you must also empower others and truly hear them. Mm. Uh, You can't expect someone else to hear you without being willing to hear someone else. Bravery can look like ego. It can be so ego driven. Um, And sometimes we view people who, especially artists, performers, creators, people who have to put themselves out there. Um, Sometimes it's like, oh my God, what a, what a giant ego or, you know, that confidence turns into some, some darkness. Um, so it's so important, um, that you do what you're saying, um, and, and think about how you respond to those things, how you use your platform, how you lift other people up, which is something you do so well is using, like you could be doing anything in the world, but you've decided to do this podcast to talk to people and lift up other creators in, in your world, which is such a beautiful thing. You could just be talking or you could just keep writing or doing your own thing, but instead you invite people in, which is also what 52 list does is like that open-ended question, that invitation to think deeper about who you are and what those questions could possibly hold. So I have homework for you after this. Ooh, I have homework. I love that. I love an assignment. When I was writing the poem, I was like, man, it's, it's so fun to write these lists. And, um, you write these lists of questions, right? Um, what if you turned that list of questions into a poem? What if you wrote a list of questions into a poem? I would love to do that. And I will do that. And I would love for people out there who are also very good at asking questions to do something Mm. similar. Mm. Uh, or to take prompting from Kate's uh, poem, which I will also take all those words and put those in an email so people can read it as well. Um, use that as a, as inspiration to to you know observe yourself, explore yourself, and allow your observations to flow out of you in stream of consciousness. Mm. Uh, sometimes things 
are you kind of need to release the container, just let them flow, see what happens, then pause, go back and look at what you've released to see and unlock parts of yourself that uh, maybe haven't had prompting to come out until until you let let it go. Yeah. Uh, you know, writing poetry is very vulnerable. Um, mm. and also brave, brave and bravery and vulnerability, I think go hand in hand. They are best friends. They challenge each other and that's a very healthy dynamic that they have. Uh, so I hope that by listening to this today, that lots of people feel very encouraged to be more brave, to be more vulnerable. And I thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Appreciate you so much. And I'll see you very soon. Oh, it was a true honor. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you. Love you, Moo. <laughs>